Hello and welcome to episode 486 of Fergie on the Freak. I'm the folks from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. And joining me here is League Freak. You can also find me on Twitter at League Freak. How you going there, mate? Going very well, Andrew RLP. Uh, how have you been lately? Not too bad, League Freak. Excellent. Yeah, it's been, it's been guys solid. That's what she said. Mmm. Solid. It's um, I didn't see the Tigers get seventy points put on them this week, so that was a good, a good thing. That's always a positive. Yeah, I mean, as much as. A... Well, let's get it out of the fucking, out of the way early. Okay. There was, there was a rumor that uh, the Tigers have been looking for a new assistant coach. Did you hear who they were looking at? Was it Justin Holbrook? It was Justin Holbrook. <laughs> fucking Jesus. <laughs> And the idea was, we need to get him on board so that he can help us get those Queensland players that we've been missing out on. Because, I mean, if you're a Queensland player, right, you're a Queensland-based player, you want to make it to the NRL. Yeah. And you're looking around and you just go, there's just no clubs out there that's got Justin Holbrook as an assistant coach. Like, I'm not enticed to go anywhere. And the Tigers have gone, you know what? We can plug that fucking gap. Mm. We're going to get all the... All the Billy Slaters, all the Darren Lockheers, we're going to get a lot of them. We're going to get that bloke over here. I'm going to put him in the assistant coach and just watch the talent roll in. Um, That's so – what a what a dumb, dumb way to think. Yeah, it's peak West Tigers, really, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Wow. And just to uh, finish off their bullshit for the week, that apparently Tim Sheens is looking for uh, – he's scouring the globe – for a new halfback for next year, including Ooh. England and France. Ooh, you know, you know what always ends up happening when he's scouring the globe. He ends up signing some like lower grade rugby union player from fucking North <laughs> Sydney. <laughs> That's a lock. He will, he will, he will get some rugby union player who hasn't even played anything of any relevance anywhere. Yeah, Remember, he yeah. signed one this year. And everyone was saying, oh, yeah, but he was pretty good and he played in the World Nines or some shit like that. I bet he doesn't see a minute of first grade. And uh, still haven't seen him. What's his name? Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Is he still there? Who knows? He's probably washing cars at an intersection somewhere. So funny with those. Uh, <laughs> remember when they had the the Rugby Union Sevens when it got to the Olympics and they were like, oh, it's going to make all the Rugby League players will come across. And it's like they ended up with like – like super lower grade rugby league players, like local A grade players. Yeah, you know, Bl- blokes that piss fight around playing footy, you know, out in the paddock with mates where there's swings on the ground. Yeah, yeah, uh, and they all left as soon as it was over. <laughs> they left, went back to rugby, league, played low rugby league. It was pretty crazy, but that, that's the West Tigers chat out of the way. The, the stupidity. Mm. Um. Yeah, the the crazy thing was okay. And we don't need to go on too much about it, but uh, New South Wales did win Origin 3. Yeah. But the the media bullshit that's gone on mm-hmm. in the aftermath of that game, mm-hmm. I think I found the, the best tweet, or sorry, the best comment in on Twitter. Okay. That sums up how fucking stupid the media's got over that one result, when nothing, when there was no pressure on the line whatsoever. Yeah, okay, hit me with it. And I'm going to tell you the name of the person who said it, and I'll probably yep. give it away, but it's Michael Ennis on Mitch Moses. All right, this is going to be a rough one. It says, Nathan is world class. He's one of the best halfbacks I've ever seen play, but he's got someone breathe, breathing down his neck now. He's got competition now. <laughs> who? <laughs> Oh man, it, it's went, it, the first thing I saw is I went Ennis, the fucking what? He, the, I think Brad Fittler has broken a lot of people. Hey, Brad Fittler's like rugby league's version of COVID. He's just broken people. <laughs> um, at, like last night, Queensland didn't play that great. Valentine Holmes had. It's weird. Valentine Holmes can have these games every so often. We watch him play in the centres and you think, oh, my God, I don't think he's a first grader as a centre. 
But then other games, he's fantastic as a centre. And this was one of those games where he was like, he was doing the Jared Crocker defensive, where like he was looking back at what the attack was doing while his teammates were trying to scramble and fix his fuck-ups. And there was a lot of that happening in this game. And that was really the difference at the end of the day. Um, but I, Mitch Moses didn't do anything. I was actually watching the game. And, and look, take, I'm not criticizing Mitch Moses. We've talked about this a couple of times. I'm like, in this system, your halves, if they can do anything, it's fucking amazing. That's what made Cody, Cody Walker's game so good. Mm. But Mitch Moses, they've taken this guy who's known for his running attack and, and turned him into a fucking punter. Like he just kicks the ball. That's it. That's, that's it. Yeah, and but, and so, that's all they turned Cleary into as well. Yeah, yeah, and so that was just the same. I'm watching that and I'm thinking this is this exact same thing with Cleary. Um, there was a lot of, uh, and I I was watching a little bit of Twitter, not heaps, and but there was a lot of stuff about Lil Y not being there and Cody Walker was so much better and stuff. I think it helped that Valentine Holmes decided to not turn up in this game, but. At the same time, I also thought that, um, you know, C- Cody played a fantastic game. And it was awesome to see after, obviously, the last time he played Origin, he fell victim to this, what happens to every other half for New South Wales under Brad Fittler. So it was cool to see him get a moment. I, I was really happy for that. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm glad Cody Walker got to have a good game at Origin level because... Mm. He's too good a player to have, to you know, to be resigned to being, you know, one of those players regarded as a great NRL player, but that's it. Yeah, the one and done sort of, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it was, it was sad, you know. That I, I remember, remember that game he played, and it was just like, he's doing nothing. But then, with hindsight of what every other half has done in this system under Fitler it's kind of par for the course for all of them and for a reason. Yeah, it's it's nuts the way yeah. they work. It it's, makes zero sense. So it was good that he had a good game. Mm-hmm. Um, got a question for you, though. Mm-hmm. How many years will Bradman Best be playing Origin for now? <laughs> well, it, lock him in for next year, right? Because I know people are going to sit there saying, oh, you, you shit on him for being picked. I went, yeah, yeah. I did, and yeah. I stand by it. Yeah. Uh, look, he, he did all right. He did all no, right. Not, not taking anything away from him. He, yeah. he played as best as he's ever going to play in that Origin game. Mm. But he's he's not an Origin-level player. No, we got we got far better players than him. Um, but lock him in for next year because that's what happens. And... Probably lock him in a little bit for the following year as well. And uh, I saw some mate, funny shit on Twitter. I saw somebody that <laughs> they they said that they were part of the media. It was funny. Um, and they were saying, I've never understood Stephen Crichton at origin level, but tonight he really he proved it. And I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Like, what do you watch? But there was a. Then I saw some of the other stuff they'd done, and it was like, oh yeah, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Mate, yeah. I think I found the best one. Okay. And again, it's another media person. Mm-hmm. This is going to go into another thing we're going to talk about, which is the RLPA media ban. Oh, I've got some stuff to say about that. Oh yeah, but this bloke is uh, he's on Twitter. I'm not going to give, mention his name because he doesn't deserve the uh, yeah. the airtime. I do. Does, if it's does, who I he, think. If it's who I, I think that you retweeted, I'd never heard of him before. No, neither have I. I saw okay. someone else retweet it and talk to him. And I went, yeah, I've got to rub it in a bit. Yeah. So he's some sports media person for a gambling outfit. And he's he's obviously against the media band because he said, Bradman Best scored two Origin tries on debut. His parents, friends and family won't hear from him or any fans. That's the RLPA. Media bands backfire on loved ones. And I thought, in my mind... So, who's this authoritarian regime that he thinks the RLPA are that they're going to deny players from talking to their own families? I know. And again, I know. if they're that authoritarian, don't you think that they just say instead of putting doing a media band, just say that's it, we're not playing any more fucking football till we get what we want? 
if they've got that authority. No, this bloke thinks they're just not going to talk to mum and dad. You fucking moron. His family was literally on the TV <laughs> earlier in the day at the game. <laughs> like, and these this is these these media types because they're not they don't know how normal people are. You know, and no. because they're all they're all nuts. All right, so they're <laughs> like, well, if if he's not talking into our microphones. Obviously, he's not talking to anyone because, you know, it all has to go through us because we're the gatekeepers. It's like, you fucking idiot. I saw Steve Mascord saying uh, like something along the lines of, it's a shame that Bradman Best won't be able to have uh, anything for his scrapbook for this game. And it's like, do you think that these fucking players get their memories from you lot? Like, fuck off. All that is shit. I think I saw... No, I got no beef with Steve Mascord, but I did see one thing he said something about. Um, like he he gets why the media bands are in place, but he would have liked to have heard from Bradman Best, and he he rattled off some questions on there about questions that um, he would have liked Bradman Best to have answered mm-hmm. about you know the lead up to the game and questions. In my mind, I was thinking. Questions I've never heard anyone in the mainstream media actually ask a player after a game of football. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of prompted me to, to make that tweet I put out there saying, the same journos who never comment on what players say after games are complaining about not being able to hear what players say after games. Yeah. You lot should be on the player's side. They give you all the content for you to do whatever it is you think you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so, They're so fucking weird, man. And, and then and, or they were like, oh... I saw there was a, a TV, ah, uh, TV, radio talk guy in New Zealand who, who, who was like, this media ban, it's no good. It's, it's cutting out, cutting out us fans. And I had to point out, you're not us fans. You are the corporate press. You're not us. Yeah, no, it, us, us fans are on the player's side. Yes. Yes, <laughs> they are. Although I tell you what, the campaign that was being put against them earlier in the week, man, it was full on. And it was full of misinformation, mm. and there were people towing their their bosses' lines so closely. It was amazing to watch, really. Yeah, pathetic, even. And, yeah, um, it's it's maddening, absolutely maddening. But full credit to the players and the RPA for being united mm-hmm. with their message and what they want, because that's never changed. Mm-hmm. Um. And they're, they're sticking to their guns as they should. Yeah, and, and you know you got to you got to back them. Like this whole the reason that we have a sport called rugby, rugby league was for players, you know. And so if you're getting to this point where you're like, oh fuck the players, there, there's you know, it's it, it's all about the fans. It's like the whole sport was about getting players compensation, really. Yeah. On some level, and it, it, like. I think people miss that point. Can we talk about fucking Gordon Tallis? Um, sure. Can I start with this? Okay. And I've not heard his comments on this yet at all, okay. because whenever I see Gordon Tallis and his opinion, yeah. in my mind, I go, what is that fat mouth, fat mouth ingrate said that's going to be relevant? And it actually sounds like English, because all I hear whenever he talks is, shut the fuck up, you dickhead. That's pretty much how I see Gordon Tallis. Pretty much. So he is on Triple M, and he was on Triple M with uh, that bald idiot that can't drive a car for 20 years. Oh, the bloke who yells at stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So two, um, two retarded monkeys yelling at one another. Pretty much. And he was talking to Clint Newton, and Clint Newton is trying to explain what is happening right now. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's two two stupid monkeys flinging poo at one another. Pretty much, yeah. Now, Gordon Tallis used to be a representative on the Players Association. Yeah. And so, so Clint Newton did something really smart. He said, what are we fighting for, Gordon? And Gordon's, uh, no, no. He said, what were you fight? What were you fighting for back then in 2003? Because Gordon Tallis brought up our they boycotted the Dally Ams and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And he said, oh, that's just the same, basically said the same thing he's going for now. And Clinton said, no, no, no. 
what were you fighting for back then? And Gordon Taylor said, well, I don't really know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All I could think was that there were people that put their faith in fucking Gordon Tallis to be their spokesman back then. <laughs> and this fucking dumb idiot didn't even know what the hell was going on. He's a and charlatan. Then, 20, me, 20 years later, he sits in front of the president of the RLPA and he dare judge him yeah. for fighting for players' rights. Fucking unbelievable. And the fact that fucking Gordon Tallis who played in an era where players lost out on hundreds of millions of dollars. Not an over-exaggeration, because the fucking game was half-owned by a media organisation who undercut the game by being on both sides of the negotiations for TV rights and broadcasting rights. And this fucking idiot, this dumb fucking idiot, is sitting across from a fucking another former player saying I think he's a real being selfish you fucking idiot that's that's the thing that gets me is that this has never been about the players being selfish not once has it been about the players being selfish yet that's what the media is trying to turn it into Mm -hmm. and that's what's so stupid it's got all the hallmarks of remember the uh, the accounting records stuff like that with Todd Greenberg just before he got the ass. Yeah, yeah. Oh, where's this? Like... What, what's with all this money to administration costs? Huh? What's he doing? What's he doing with it? And going, it's all laid out in the balance sheet, mate. Go and fucking read it. It's just disappeared. They won't even tell us. It's like oh, but it's a big we... money amount. Where'd it go? <laughs> and then we're doing a podcast where we're literally <laughs> reading the fucking balance sheet. <laughs> That was on the NRL website. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like if you if you can't understand and are also not willing to read and learn about the thing that you're going to go and comment on, shut your fucking mouth. Yes. Simple as that. But yes, yes tell us of all people as a former player and as a former member of the RLPA. For him to be bitching about this shows how little he was paying attention back then Mm -hmm. and how much of a media lackey and, and, uh, yeah, an absolute charlatan that he is. Um, It was just unbelievable. And, like, Clint Newton was saying how when Talos was being a part of the representative group of the players – uh, Clint Newton had only been in the NRL for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And he said, like, we we're putting our faith in you to know what was going on. And I, I just, I couldn't believe it. I, it was one of the biggest moments of ownage I've ever seen in rugby <laughs> league. Just this guy who was like so self-righteous and like so ready to judge. And then he just gets shown up for not even knowing what he was fucking doing back in his day, let alone what's happening now. Oh, uh, what a fucking idiot! Absolute goose. Yeah, absolute goose. But yes, there's the RLPA. Uh, day and a half ago, put out a list of uh, frequently asked questions, but which they've answered about the CBA dispute. Mm-hmm. Um, you can go to the RLPA website and see it there. But if you want, we can go through it. Yeah, let's go through it. Okay. So because people, got... uh, people are honestly, I, I feel like they're hearing from the media who are just saying, we don't even know what years are after. And the RLPA is like, we, there's a list. And so let's go through the list. All right, who so the first question, is this all about money? No, we've not asked for a single dollar more from the NRL since December 2022. Why did the players take action? After 20 months of negotiating... The NRL responded to the player's settlement proposal with 100 drastic changes and said it was a take-it-or-leave-it offer, effectively halting negotiations. The players were left with little choice but to take action and get the NRL back to the negotiating table. Has that list of 100 changes been publicly made available anywhere? I don't believe it is. The thing about the CBA, it's basically... It's a it's a real bedrock... Uh, it's a real bedrock part of the entire game's financial breakdown. 
So there would be certain things that both sides wouldn't want out in public um, because it's all confidential stuff, you know? Yeah, I, that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, you know, because I hadn't, that's the first time I'd heard of the 100 changes. I didn't think it was yeah. that many. I knew yeah. there was a fair few in there, but that was, yeah. you, know, you only ever heard of numerous. Mm-hmm. So that was the word used. Um, what is the intent of the action? The RLPA and NRL must agree to recommence negotiations with an industrial relations mediator to reach an outcome on their 100 plus changes to our settlement proposal. We have nothing to hide and neither should the NRL. Let's allow an expert to reach an outcome on all resolved matters. The player's current action will only end once there is a draft CBA ready to be taken to NRL and NRLW players for ratification. NRL player benefits must also return to pre-COVID levels for 2023. Um, are the RLPA against expansion? No. <laughs> uh, what is the issue with the season schedule then? Uh, the NRL want to have full control rather than equal agreement rights with players and clubs to add more rounds to the NRL schedule. That would be at least another 16 matches that they don't have to agree with the RLPA. So that's two more rounds. Yeah, and uh, that's I significant. Think- don't they go to round 27 this year? Yeah, they uh, do. So that, that would take it to round 29. It's getting fucking super league-like now. I know, that, and that would suck. Oh, yeah. Um, this would place the health and safety risk on players and is a clear player workload issue. At a time when the game was has never been more intense, the NRL and ARL commission should not be looking to increase the match obligations of players without their agreement. Agreement, which is different to consultation with players, is not stopping the game from moving forward. It's respecting the players as partners who put their bodies on the line for the product and working together. I agree. Why would you... We don't need 29 fucking rounds. We don't need 27 rounds. Yeah, I agree. I agree. There's probably a couple couple too many right now. Well, yeah, um, I mean, at the moment, this year, every team's going to have three buys. Yeah, yeah. It's like, why? If you can fit in three buys in a year, your season's too long. Yeah. It's just that simple. Because you give them three buys because it is too long, so you're trying to make sure they get ample breaks within the season. Mm-hmm. But this teams like Parramatta, for example, um, and this is the best example because their third buy is in the last round of the year. Mm. So they're going the longest break of any of the teams. Everyone else is going to be getting lots of breaks. Like the Tigers, there's a few others have already had all their three buys. Yeah, I think Penrith have had all of theirs. Yeah. At its point. And so some teams are now going to have to go eight weeks and then the entire finals run without a single buy in there. Others mm. are going to have to go from, you know, a few weeks ago all the way through to the final round. Then they get their buy. Mm. It's not a smart or sensible situation. Like, we should all be having our buys within the same sort of five, six-week period, and then yeah. they're all out of the way. Yeah. And it makes it as even as possible then. This weird system that got set up where... Some weeks we'll have seven games. Some weeks we'll have five games. Fucking hell! I, I think that the, I think that the regular season schedule is half broken at the moment, and they they really need to sort it out. I, I think that if you're going to have state of origin, it needs to be over within six weeks. Um, oh that's yeah, one yeah. Thing, you know, and and there needs to there needs to be standalone rounds for mm-hmm. state of origin when. You know, there's no club football, so that players aren't missing games here and there, and that's that's the best of the worst situation. But this has been an issue for quite a few years: the fact that the yeah. origin period is stretched out so long. Yeah, because it does have a negative impact on the product, the NRL product. Mm-hmm. And I know I've said before, yeah, three consecutive weeks have origin in those three weeks, all three games. And put some international football in there as well. Put some women's football in there. Put the whole lot in there. Three-week rep period. Bam. Get it in. Smash it out. All eyes on the international and and state games, stuff like that. Still going to be great. Still going to rate well. Still going to get good crowds and make money because all eyes are still on it. The NRL is not going to be taken away from that contest. It's on hold for three weeks. Yeah. That means everyone's had their buys for three weeks as well. You yeah. don't even need to call them buys. The game's yeah. just been paused for three weeks, and then boom, back into it we go. Yeah, see how that goes. It can't be any worse than what we've got now. No, you can just go eleven games, 
So 11 straight rounds, three weeks off where we all have Origin, all those rep games, and then the last 11 games. Yeah. 22 rounds over 25 weeks. I can't see how there's a problem with that. And this no. is, I mean, a three-week three, three week fucking break for anyone who's, you know, playing for the West Tigers and is not going to get called up for rep duty. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's one I wasn't, I hadn't heard about. It says, he, what's the issue with player data? Mm-hmm. The NRL's position on the collection and storage of player data, medical and otherwise, doesn't comply with privacy laws. They're attempting to assert ownership over player data and use or sell it without the informed consent of the player. Man, that's rough. That's rough. I remember when I was asked to get a your accreditation to do the commentary, mm-hmm. and I, I didn't want to do it. And I was asked very nicely, and I said, "All right, send me send me what I've got to do." And I think it was a website, the New South Wales Rugby League website that I was sent to. Yep. They wanted my passport number, mm-hmm. my name, address, telephone. Date of birth, uh, it was past the driver's license numbers, and I and I looked at it, and I I got in touch with the person that asked me very nicely. And I said, "Listen," and they were they were great. They knew what they knew. They'd known me for years and years, and they knew what I was like. And I said, "Listen, I, I'm not doing it, <laughs> even if it means I can't do the commentary." And they were like, "Man, I knew you were going to say that. I'll sort it out. Don't worry." Um, so the idea that players would be handing over on top of that medical information and stuff like that is fucking outrageous that the NRL doesn't want that protected. I think privacy laws. The other player data, and that, and that could just be stuff like, you know, height, weight, um, mm. and like in-game stats, tackle counts, shit like that. Yeah. I'm less concerned about that. But yeah. the medical stuff, yeah, that's overstepping the fucking boundary that is. Yeah, that's outrageous. That's miles wrong. Yeah. Um, and that will be almost entirely about um, CCE concerns. Almost exclusively, I'd reckon. So. Yeah, you would think so. Because the, the RLPA would... If the RLPA wanted to conduct um, any sort of research with that sort of data, they could do it. Um, it wouldn't be up to the NRL. I, I, that's 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 really outrageous. Yeah, I think if it comes to something like that, and they want to collect data for CT, for example, it should not be done by the club or the NRL because they've got a vested interest in the club and the NRL, mm-hmm. and less so in the player. Mm-hmm. All right, so it needs to be an independent. Um, entity that's collecting that data, and one that's specific in that health reason. So, if it's, if, as I said, if it's with CT, then it needs to be an independent outlet that's got nothing to do with the NRL or the clubs, and their interest is solely in the human that they're dealing with, because that should be where the interest is. Yeah, that's why I would think that it would be more the RLPA that would be doing it on behalf of their members. Yeah, I'd um, be, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that shouldn't be made public. Like, no. you can put in there the, you know, the collection of data, but it can't be attached to any specific human. So you say, oh, look, there's 27 players that could be susceptible to CTE if they get any more concussions. But that's where that ends. So you don't name anyone. You don't do anything to try and describe who they might be. None of that. So you've got to look after the privacy like that. Because it shouldn't matter. To, you can't make rules around specific players to try and help them. You can't have in there a specific Luke Keery rule. You know what I mean? So yeah. they don't need to know who the player is. They just need to know, okay, well, that number's growing or it's getting less. So, you know, we know we're moving in the right direction or wrong direction. We tweak things here, there to try and fix this up. And they need to know about, you know, the mechanics of the tackle and what sort of tackles it is that's causing the concussions and that sort of, that sort of thing. That's what they need to know. They don't need to have ownership of the players, the players' specific medical data, just the end data that is not specific to players but an overarching data set that you can give to anybody no one's going to know who it belongs to. I would also say this. Would you want anybody at the NRL to be responsible for having 
your medical history being able to be pulled up and maybe given to a third party that might put it in a newspaper. You know? No, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, that's why I don't want it to be with the NRL or with the clubs. Yeah, yeah. Because the NRL's got a vested interest in making sure they protect their own ass, as does the club. Yeah. And let's remember that players and clubs are not loyal to each other. Well, the, the situation you could end up with, and this is completely hypothetical, is say there was a player that was suing the NRL for uh, concussion symptoms. Mm -hmm. And it goes into the media and and people start talking about it. But the NRL has on their file that this player had a a drug issue or an alcohol issue or something because it's part of their their medical history. Yep. Um, that, That could somehow get into the wrong hands and end up out in public. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Yeah, that that might be written on a piece of paper somewhere that actually gets, accidentally gets left on a bar. Yeah, yeah. At a pub. Is that the is that passing the pub test? Oh, that would definitely pass the pub test. <laughs> <laughs> that is the pub test. Yeah. <laughs> um there's, there's a link through on here about what is the issue with financial reporting? What is the issue with international payments? The international one was um, interesting. The NRL have included international payments for NRL run international series to be paid for by the players. So at the moment, the only NRL run international series we've had was, I believe, the World Nines. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the NRL have included international payments for NRL run international series to be to be paid for by the players. That is a cost that has not previously been included in the CBA, primarily because it relates to employment for a player's nation, not in the NRL. Yeah. So my my understanding is that basically the NRL uh, and the Players Association they have an agreement for a percentage split on the the money that the game has, and the percentage split that the players get, I believe, is forty percent. And that, and basically, what the my understanding is that the NRL is saying we want the money for those international games to come out of your forty percent, and the Players Association is saying, but th- this our agreement is between us and the NRL, and and these extra games are uh, they're not really part of that agreement. They're not part of this. Uh, pool of money that we've agreed to. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What is the issue with the NRL minimum salaries? For 2023, the NRL wants to reduce the top 30 minimum salary from $130,000 to $120,000, the supplementary list to minimum salary from $85,000 to $70,000, and weekly training wages from $1,200 to $1,000. Why are they wanting to cut it after COVID and everything's back to normal? Yeah, I don't under, I don't know. I don't know the reason for that because the money's there. Like the, there's no question about it, have we got the money to do all of this stuff? We 100% do. Uh, it has been earned. It is there, you know. The NRL is in surplus by tens of millions of dollars the, the last few years, even through COVID. I believe it, it made a surplus. So the money's there, and and it's weird that they want to cut costs. It'd be interesting to know why the NRL wants to cut the costs. I don't know. I, Might I be something to do with the fact that they got less money from the rights deal. <laughs> I you know, thought that was. <laughs> look, I would have thought that, but the, as I said, the money's the money's there. Like, I I don't know what mm. it is. The only thing I can think is that if they come out and said, look, clubs have looked at how much they're they're paying with the minimum wage and and training fees and all that and they don't believe that it works for those lower tier players it could be causing problems i don't know but we don't know that because the nrl aren't talking about it and that's their right as well to not talk about it yeah like they might be finding that 
that they're getting players and they're putting them on minimum wage. And once they get that minimum wage put away, there's a, a decent percentage of them that put their feet up for the year, basically, and don't put in. And so they're, they're finding that if you have X number of players on minimum wage at a club, it's not cost effective. No. It just seems weird that they, like, I would have thought in a negotiation, if you wanted to cut some sort of salary. Yeah. So say you want to cut the top 30 minimum salary from 130 to 120. Mm-hmm. Then you'd leave the weekly training wages at 1200 instead of trying to cut that as well. Like yeah. You'd, that... you'd leave a cherry to try and say, you know, we're going to work both ways. Help us out here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. agree. They've just been pricks either way, either way here. Yeah. They've gone, so what we're going to do is fuck you, and then while we're doing that, we're going to fuck you again. Again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the issue with integrity? The NRL have tried to place significant limitation on the RLPA's access to integrity-related notices, limiting our ability to fully support players and ensure the process is a fair one. I mean, that's pretty vague, so I'm not too sure that's in reference to there. But So, uh, yeah, so I, my my understanding with that is that if there is a player that has been brought before the integrity unit, the NRL wants to be able to keep all of the information to themselves and not pass it on or share it with the RLPA. Who are the player's representative and who deserve to have that information? Well, that just seems stupid. Yeah. Uh, Okay. What is the issue with insurance? This one always uh, interests me. The NRL has tried to include representative injury insurance being paid for from the player's money, despite that insurance being of zero benefit to the player's. This insurance is not a benefit for players. It is a club benefit, so the players shouldn't have to pay for it. Players have contract security already, so this would be paying insurance for the salaries players are already entitled to. Mm. So it's like double dipping on the insurance payment for no reason. Yeah, pretty much. So at the moment, and Anthony Watmow, I believe, was a really good example of this. He, uh, his career was over prematurely, and I believe Parramatta, um, they enacted an insurance claim on that. On That's his correct. injury, and it meant that they got he, Anthony Watmere. How how much he was going to earn with or without any, the injury was he was always going to get it because he, in, in the NRO a player's salary is guaranteed if club goes bust, if they you know you might have a career ending injury tomorrow and you've still got three le- years left on your deal. You get every single year of that that deal. Doesn't That's matter right. what happens to you. So Anthony Watmau got all of his money, but because Parramatta had to pay him that money, they had insurance on his deal, and they were able to claim insurance and get that money back. And so the RLPA is one hundred percent correct that it's double dipping, basically. That's right. And the whole reason why the, the Eels did that was because it meant that they could pay out Watmo straight away. Mm-hmm at no cost to their salary cap or their actual bottom dollar, and they could replace what may immediately with someone of the same value. Was that the case? That would that would be how it would be working because he's cleared. So the, the hit is on their salary cap for the year they pay him out. It's not on the years after it. Yeah, like I would have no problems. I'm sure that's that how it long, would work. Yeah, as long as it was medically cleared. And that play did, I mean, what Mao really did, that he did, it wasn't it was, like he... Ended up doing anything after that. There was um, another player as well. Was it? Did they do? Did South do with Greg Inglis as well? I can't remember. And then Inglis turned up a few years later over in Warrington. Was it? You know, you know who I think you're thinking of. Wasn't it Sam Burgess? I was just thinking that it might have been Sam Burgess. Yeah, I think it was. Sam, there was something that happened with Sam Burgess along right. those lines. It was a shoulder thing, and he came back from it. Yeah, and, you, and yeah. that's and people were like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, when they come back, you go, mm, you know what? Maybe that should be revoked. I'm yeah, that well, too. that's why it has to be cleared, and it's really difficult because if you get a doctor that that says, look, this player X Y Z, his knee is no good, his career is effectively over, and everyone everyone at that moment can ag- ag- agrees to it. The player manager, the club, and the NRL. And then two years down the track, his fucking knee feels pretty good, you know? And he gets a call from England. And they say, do you reckon you can play half a season? And and, and so it's difficult. It's a real difficult one. 
And it, that's why it's, it's very rarely used because of that. Hmm, what else we got here? Uh, what is the issue with player property? The NRL wants to reduce player property protection and give themselves the right to exploit individual player property. My guess is that that is maybe player likenesses and stuff like that. I assume it is. Yeah. Um, so that would be big in video games, advertising, stuff like that. So there's two rather lengthy bits there about the controlling where the money is spent. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll go through this because this is important. The NRL want to control where the players spend their share of revenue. What right does the NRL have to determine where a member-based association spends its own members' money? This includes the Injury and Hardship Fund, Past Player Program, Retirement Account, Wellbeing and Education, General Hardship Fund, and more. All funds established by players. The NRL is trying to restrict how much funding the RLPA can have, despite that. The money that we run our business on comes from the player's share. The players fund the RLPA, not the NRL. When it comes to revenue generated by stakeholders, the NRL is effectively a bank that distributes each stakeholder's share. The NRL also want to control the RLPA's operating costs and for us to run on less funding than we secured in the 2018-2022 CBA. Less funding despite servicing over 60% more players through the 17th NRL team and up to 12 NRLW teams over the term. The NRL want the RLPA to do more work for less money in an attempt to depower us. This is classic union busting and is a complete overreach into an independent association. We must be able to con- continually meet player needs and appropriately fund the RLPA, which is determined by the players and their board. Not only do they want us to operate on less than we secured under the last CBA, the NRL expects that the RLPA should take on more responsibilities, such as the past player and transition programs, but restrict our ability, as determined by the players, to increase the appropriate funding to run those. Any increase in the funding of the association comes from the players and their share. We do not go to the NRL for money, but they still want to restrict us. And to top it off, the NRL is trying to dictate how many commercial partners, including servicing arrangements, the RLPA can have, reducing our ability to generate additional money that could help support players. We have to ask their permission to enter into a commercial agreement. Yeah, I can see both sides with a couple of these things. First of all, the NRL doesn't want to have a situation where, <coughs> excuse me, it enters into a commercial agreement with an organisation and then finds out the, the RLPA is entering a commercial commercial agreement with that competitor of that commercial entity. Does that make sense? Yeah. So... So say let's let's use our website as, as an example. Say the NRL does a deal with Rugby League Project to be a major sponsor, but Rugby League Project has this giant, charismatic, sexy rival called LeagueFreak.com, and LeagueFreak.com does this deal with the RLPA, and all of a sudden the NRL is like, we can't have competing commercial entities working against one another. You know, um, that's basically what it is. Yeah. In that situation, just, they'd, they'd soon find out that we're actually working together to take down both the NRL and the RPA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're basically trying to take everything over. That's us. That's us. Um, just, so that you can buy, just so that you can buy the domain NRL.com. <laughs> yeah, that would be the whole reason. <laughs> Oh, shit. I, you know, I watched a video uh, last night about a guy that worked out. You remember the show Mythbusters? Yeah, yeah. Well, this guy worked out that the the company that owned Mythbusters, Time Warner, they let the trademark run out of Mythbusters, so he bought it. Oh, no way. <laughs> and he started, he started selling merch, and he got all of the lawyer letters sent to him. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> anyway. Um, so, so there's that situation. The other situation is uh, the RLPA. Look, if I'm the NRL and I I see that the RLPA is in a pretty good financial situation now compared to where it used to be, um, I can see the R uh, the NRL saying, "Look, some of the things that we fund are more appropriate for you guys to fund." And so we would like you to take them over. 
Now you could you could talk your way around that you take them that extra responsibility on if you're the RLPA, and in that sense it cuts down your funding because you're not getting any extra funding to do that stuff. So you have less money. So it, I, I can see both sides of that one. I'm not saying who's right or wrong, but you, sometimes with these things, you've got to read between the lines, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a follow-up here. It looks like it was written yesterday. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. It says on here, players respond to stalled CBA negotiations. After meeting with over 50 player leaders from all clubs last night, in brackets, Tuesday, players have unanimously decided that they must take action as a result of the NRL's unreasonable CBA ultimatum. And it goes on about, you know, the 100 points and the NRL's take it or leave it stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the unreasonable ultimatum from the game's administrators has forced players to take action that will see all players boycott media obligations on any day there is an NRL, NRLW or State of Origin match. On those days, players will only participate in content produced for club-owned media channels. Mm-hmm. So this would be the one that came out. Was this last week? <clears throat> must have been updated because it says um, the, the date of it says just now. I'm looking at it going, it doesn't mm-hmm. seem like just now. Yeah. My And my guess is that they were clarifying things as, so in the, the media, they were, they were very big on pushing that, oh, the, you know, fans won't get any interaction with the players at all. And, but you were through your, your club social media channels and websites and mailing lists and things like that. You were still getting um, interaction with those players. And I think that they probably had to reiterate that to some of their members and then they reiterated that to the wider public through their website. Yep. Um, so, yeah, basically what we're seeing is the NRL, they're effectively trying to de-unionise the players. Yeah. Which and- goes against everything that the, the game has stood for, as you alluded to earlier. Mm. And... I don't, I don't know why they think that that's a good idea. Well, the, I mean, the RLPA is, it's not like they're a militant union. You know, they're very chilled, actually. Um, there are some, know, more often than not, we've found, they're pretty reasonable. Yeah, exactly. So, so they're not going out of the way, as we're seeing here, they're not going out of the way to demand the payers... I paid more money. That's never been an issue here. Mm-hmm. It's all this other stuff around looking after the players, especially the players that are at the um, lower spectrum of the wage um, cycle anyway, and that's basically the female players and the um, players on minimum wage. Mm-hmm. They're trying to help them out, get them up to a, a workable salary so that they don't need to have jobs away from the game in order to get by in life. Like they're full-time professionals. They should be full-time professionals to the sport. Um, That's fine. That's fair. I'm 100% on board with that. But the NRL seems to be hell-bent on impacting players and how they earn money or, you know, looking after one another. If the NRL wants to save money, why don't they have a word with the clubs? Like, you know, we're giving you all the players' wages Mm. and a fucking club grant. How's about, instead of trying to rip the players off, we just take, say, 250 grand out of the club grant for all of your clubs? Boom. There's a few million dollars back in the coffers. I think the reason I won't do that is because the clubs, I believe, now have a voting interest on the Australian Rugby League Commission. They do. And so that, that, I mean, it's basically... It causes problems. <laughs> well, the, the crazy thing about this is both the RLPA and the ARLC and the NRL and all of the clubs will achieve absolutely fucking nothing without the players. So you'd think that they'd be looking after the players' interests first and foremost, especially when the players have been pretty bloody reasonable. But they want yeah. to play fucking hardball with them. Right? Yeah. Then what? What happens if the players go on strike? Then how are you going to make your money? 
I th I think the thing that if I was in the NRL, the thing I would be looking to do is make sure that the RLPA is has got what it needs to be self-sustaining so that I can become hands-off with it. So that my negotiation pro that like the negotiation for the percentage split is basically going to be set in stone for the most part for a very long time. So that's not a problem. So you, there's no negotiation over money. It's just a split. However much comes into the game, players get a percentage of it. And that's been agreed upon. Um, I, I would look to get the RLPA into a position where a lot of the responsibility for players and maybe past players and things like that is on their shoulders. That's where I would be looking to push it and take the responsibility off the NRL itself. Um, a couple of the things that people have been, they probably misunderstand the situation a little bit. Um, I saw people saying to me last week that the players should fund International Rugby League. The RLPA should fund International Rugby League, which is outrageous. Why? I don't know. It's not their job. It's the job of organisations like the NRL, the New Zealand Rugby League, the Rugby Football League. That's their job. And there's no question about that. Uh, another thing I saw was people saying, well, maybe the RLPA should fund Junior Rugby League. Once again, it's not their job. That's the job of the NRL, the Rugby Football League, the New Zealand Rugby League. That is literally why they exist. What Do, do people not realise how the RLPA gets its money? It's clear I, they don't. They seem to think that the RLPA is making its money like from all sorts of places and they've got tons of it going, the players give them their money. Yeah, I don't think they do. I honestly don't think they do. Um, the it's last a thing, union. If you look at any union, the mm. members of that union is what gets them their bulk share of their money. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that look. That the last thing I'll say is this. Right. They're currently playing under a handshake agreement CBA deal. I said it. That, I don't know if you remember this at the beginning of the year. We mentioned that the CBA wasn't set in stone yet, and I said they should strike right now. Um, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I, if it, if it was up to me and I was the head of the RLPA, there would not have been one training session. There would not have been even a, a – there would have been nothing. Everything would have stopped until the CBA was in place. And that is just par for the course on CBA deals in every single major sporting competition around the world. That's what an NBA lockout is about. That's what an NFL lockout is about. That's what a Major League Baseball lockout is about. Because they don't decide on a CBA, they decide to lock the players out. All right? Now, the Players Association could do the same thing, saying, we're not going to fucking play the season. That's what I would have done to make sure the CBA was in place. This Players Association is really fucking reasonable. And they yeah. don't want to do that. The last thing they want to do is strike. And this was the the smallest thing they could do to get it into the to the press. And as they said, it worked. Hopefully yeah. the NRL see the error of their ways because I tell you what, you go into next year and if this CBA is still a problem, I would fucking strike 100% if I was a player. And I've said that before. Remember when Newcastle players stopped getting paid? Yep. Couple of, uh, and I don't. I think we had this podcast at that time because yeah. I remember saying, "Fucking my first check doesn't end up in my bank account. I don't leave my fucking couch. I don't yeah, need to my phone to put the club." <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Why would you? Why would you? Fuck them. Exactly. You've so, got yeah. to be getting your money. You've got to be getting looked after. That's the fucking job. You turn up. You play football, you do it under an agreement. They've been doing it without an agreement for a fucking long time. Which means and, they've and been they, doing more than their fair share of helping out the NRL. Yeah. You'd think the NRL would be a bit more, you know, gracious. Yeah, just get it fucking sorted. Get it out the way. The, we've all got money. Everyone's got money. The NRL's got heaps of money. The clubs have got heaps of money. Everything's funded. It, everything's there's no it's not like we're scrimping and saving for money anymore the fucking no. game's rich yeah so why the fuck are we in this situation it's pvl it's, it's you know 
That's probably why he's going to wants to take us to Vegas. So you just take all of the NRL's coin and put it on red. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's it's I'll buy the union. Oh fuck. And the oh, thing I'll that... put all of New South Wales Greyhound racing. Let's put that on red. The fucking thing that gets me is that you 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 see the media purposefully being say, pretending to be ignorant about the situation. And fucking people online will just run the same line that these fucking media types run, you know? Yeah. It's so infuriating. It is. It is. Um, because the, the media now has, more than ever before, less interest in giving you the facts of what's going on, and they are entirely interested in pushing their agenda. Mm-hmm. They don't care who they besmirch along the way. As long as we make it clear that we're the good guys and they're all fucked, and so mm-hmm. be looking after us and we'll keep you on the straight and narrow. Yeah, that shit ain't right. And they shit on every player. Yeah. Like every single one. I think of Daly Cherry Evans. That guy's never done a fucking bad thing ever. He's only ever been very well spoken. He's won at every single level. He's won pretty much everything he can in the game. And they ran fucking campaigns against him for years, saying, oh, the the Queensland players don't like him. Shit like that. They do it to every single player. It it fucking pisses me off. And this week we saw how little we need the, the media types. Nothing stopped. It, nothing fucking stopped for a second without those assholes. Oh, did you see what the, the the big news was in rugby league circles? No, I could. Yeah, it was. Um, Phil Gould said something, and so Buzz Rothfield replied. I did, <laughs> I don't know what any of it was, but that was the news that dominated three days of the media. There you go. There you go. They just start talking amongst themselves and think it's news. Well, I mean that's that's just what they do anyway. Bunch of fucking geriatrics. Dude, when we're fucking 80, if I have Twitter, shoot me in the head, okay? We'll still be on there. We'll be the other two left on there. (laughs) Still got Twitter? Yeah. Oh, it's still there. I just just saw a news article about um, one one of the halves that the Tigers are looking at. Oh, who is it? Former Storm Broncos halfback, currently playing in the Super League. Brody Croft. Yep. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Bring back Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's no. That's no. That's a rough one. Although it could be worse. You you could have uh, you could have done what the Manly Seagulls did and, and brought aboard fucking Matt Lodge. No, yeah, that's true. And Matt, I'll tell you what, they fucking... they continue they continue their splurge on buying former West Tigers players because you it's, know, yeah, it's crazy. Um, oh man, that's that's all sorts of bad. I had something else that I was going to add in there too. That was something that came up in the news. I can't remember what it was now. Well, I, I tell you what, <sighs> I, this is this is a question that I got asked a couple of weeks ago, and I forgot to ask you, right? Because uh-huh. there was a rumor that RTS. Uh, Roger Tuivasa-Shek was going to join an NRL club this year, and there was a rumour that it was going to be the Penrith Panthers. Yeah, I remember remember we discussed this. But did did I ask you... Did I ask you on the podcast if you would sign him if you were the Panthers? No, you didn't, but I'd also say no. Okay, because I said... Okay, because on Twitter I was talking to people about it, and I said I would ask you that question because the Panthers fans that were talking about it were like, where do you put him, you know? And there were some people that were saying, listen, you're all being crazy. It's RTS and you get him and you play him at fullback. And my reply was, we've got Edwards and we're premiers and you don't fuck it up while it's working. Exactly and right. I, and look, I... I understand their point of view of they were like, you're being crazy now. It's RTS. And so I wanted to ask you that question, but I forgot to ask you. <laughs> so you wouldn't do it either. 
No, no, no. Why, okay. why would you? You, would, If you're going to bring in RTS, it's to make a significant upgrade because that's what he is. Mm-hmm. But he's not a significant upgrade on Edwards, especially not on the way Edwards plays and works with the rest of that spine. Mm-hmm. It's a different method to the way RTS plays. So I don't think the RTS style would suit the way the Panther spine operates. There's also a... One of my arguments was also that you've got this team that's basically grown up together and to bring in a guy from another sport and look, he's been playing rugby union. So his, his conditioning is going to be very poor. We know that he's going to, he's going to need a really, really good off season to get back into league fitness. Um, has he been playing in the three quarter line? Or has he been playing at fullback in union? If he's, if he's been playing at, at fullback, He's not going to be too bad. If he's been playing in the three-quarter line, he probably hasn't moved. I I don't know because I would rather spend two hours shaving my balls than watching Rugby Union. What a set of balls they are, Andrew, oh, let me tell you. Well, mate, we, we saw them when you had your thong on backwards. Oh, fuck yeah. It's just <laughs> hanging out either side of it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's wrong with us? We got a fucking problem. Where did that come from? I don't. That's I don't know. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> How can we be the only people that actually fucking talk about and break down what the RLPA wants, and then five minutes later we're talking about my balls hanging out? <laughs> we're about nuts. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh boy. Um. <laughs> what are we talking about again? Oh, yeah, RTS. You're nuts. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't know what he does in Rugby Union because mainly I don't care. But yeah. if he wanted to come to Penrith on a short-term uh, minimum wage contract with the idea that if something happens to someone in our back line during the final series, you might have a start, I, I would look at it then. But outside of that, I'm not getting him to – replace any of the current back line because they're all they're all on fire it's really weird yeah you don't you don't need to muck with that yeah you just don't um speaking of signings Mm -hmm. shane flanagan was reported early in this week saying that he's looking to bring in four or five new players to the dragon side next year oh nice and uh based on the sort of teams he's he's had in the past uh pretty much Every prop over the age of 29 is going to be on his radar. <laughs> yeah, well, my, I mean, I remember when he was coaching the Sharks, and I don't know what it was about his coaching techniques, but they seemed to play some of their best football really, really, really late into a normal career. They just had something extra. I, don't, I can't quite put my finger on it. You probably need a bit more than just one finger. Yeah, probably. Um, um but yeah, no. The, the other thing that came out too is I think yesterday or the day before, mm-hmm. for some reason he was commenting on the fact that his son has had several contract offers. All right. I thought, oh, I wonder if one of those comes from you. <laughs> I'm almost certain. There's been no talk about it. I will be surprised if Kyle doesn't end up at the Dragons. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Especially now that the the Bulldogs have signed a replacement for him already. Yeah, they got Sexton. Yep. And they've got Burton, so they don't need Flanagan now. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Dragons got rid of Ben Hunt. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, look, at it might be a good situation for him playing under his dad. That no means chance. That you don't reckon? Nope. Oh, okay. No. And it's got nothing to do with the fact of the way Kyle plays, mm-hmm. or even take all the muck about Shane Flanagan's career out of it and just look at this, the way he makes teams play, it is all forward dominated. Yeah. Okay, so no halfback worth a pinch of shit is going to play under that Flanagan system because mm-hmm. they're not going to do anything. It's like being coached by um, Brad Fiddler. <laughs> Your job is just to turn up and kick the ball to the corners. That's it. Yeah. So he might as well just put a 5-8 there. He's got a big boot on him. 
that's it. That's that's all they're going to do. They've got no. They don't use creativity. I mean, you think the Sharks halfback through that whole Flanagan period was Chad Townsend. Yeah, right. just a and kicker. He's, he's a kicker. He's a solid enough kicker, and the yeah. playmaking was didn't have to be much because there wasn't much to do. Yeah, all they did was just hit up, hit up, hit up, hit up, hit up, kick to the corner. Mm-hmm. That was it. Eventually, as I said, regardless of all the muck that went on, mm-hmm. even teams that have got a half decent forward pack, if they've got good ball control, and they just do four fucking hit-ups and kick to a corner. Eventually, the opposition side's going to get tired in the middle from constantly defending that shit. Yeah. And it's going to lead to a few points being scored through there. Not a lot. Mm -hmm. As you'll see from the Sharks' record, they didn't win games by lots of points. No. They're constantly winning by two, four, six points, something like that, and very rarely were they getting to 20 points and winning games. They were getting it done with 14 and 16 points. Yeah. And the games were absolute fucking bludges to watch. <laughs> they were, weren't they? Oh, punishing. Fucking punishing. Um, and if he thinks he's going to replicate that style at this Dragon side with what they've got at the moment, they're in for a lot of pain. Yeah, that's going to be rough with the the personnel they've got. Also with the personnel that other teams have at the moment too. Yeah. Like there's a there's a lot of teams, that, you know. If your idea is to go through the middle of the the park on them, you you're just not going to be able to do it. And I think of the Panthers, the Broncos. They're they're the two ones that jump out at me. Even South at the moment, to a certain extent, their forward packs improved a fair bit. Oh yeah. Um. So yeah, it's it, that's a rough one. I tell you, one player that come on the market is apparently Payne Haas is available. Yeah. Uh probably rule out a couple of clubs for him straight away. Um, <laughs> unless he's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, would, would the Tigers take him? I mean, they've it, got a space available at halfback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to set that one up and knock it over. I know. <laughs> um, he'd probably he'd be, talk more than Brooks. But... That's true. Where? Just, just by turning up and saying hello. Yeah. It's six years worth of Brooks talk right there. Yeah, exactly. Um, where do you think it'd be the best place for Payne Haas? So, so if he doesn't go if he doesn't go back to the Broncos on bigger money, um have you got anywhere for him? To go to where he'll benefit the team he goes to as well as himself. Well, where would be the best place for him? He, he needs a team that's got one other good prop and a good hooker. Mm. And he's a big dude, so he, he, he can't... <laughs> like, Sorry. if he went to Melbourne, I mean, I, I always say players should go to Melbourne, but do they have the right forward pack to have around him? Almost. Almost. I feel like you need a few more uh, mobile back rollers around him because he's so big. Yeah, that's why they're not far off. Um, yeah. They've got the spark out of dummy half that he needs. Yeah. Um, well, they have been playing um, um, Nelson Nassif for Solomon a bit wider of the ruck this year, which has been working out pretty well. It's been great, yeah. So... I don't know. Um, hmm. Or does he just stand up going all cl- – do, does he just stand up at the Roosters? You know, they, if they're getting rid of um, – what's the Kiwi bloke? You, oh, you get, Rory Hargroves. Yeah, because he, I think he's retiring at the end of the year or maybe he's going to Super League. I'm not sure. But do they do – they, Get rid of him. Do they try and offload Victor Radley onto someone else and bring in Payne Haas? And it's just a it's just a deal like that. Look, that's that's probably most plausible. I think the best place for him mm-hmm. would be South. Yeah. Imagine he's getting the ball with Cook making a 
you know, a scooty out of dummy half and getting the defence on the backwards straight away and then Haas is running at you while you're going backwards. Fuck that. Yeah, that would suck. The only thing that I feel like would ruin that is um, they're getting um, – what's the dude from Canberra? His name Whiten. Yeah, I know. And so that and that's a whack of money right there. I don't yeah. know if they'd be able to free up another whack of money. Probably not. But that would be the best place for him, uh, for both him and for the team he's going to, I think. Who else yeah. would there be? Um, what if, okay, I've got one for you. What if they probably won't do it? But what if the Parramatta Eels tell Dylan Brown to leave? Mm, yeah. It's a it's a risk for them. But he would shore up their forward pack. That'd be a hell of a forward pack for them. And I'd, could they do without a Dylan Brown? They they'd have to bring somebody else into that five eighth role. But it might be I think I d I don't mean to say that this is them being equal, but I think if you were to move Gutherson to six Mm-hmm. Put a proper fullback in who will do kick returns. Mm. That would fix up Parramatta a lot very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, Gutherson's creative enough to play at six. He's basically doing it anyway in attack. Let's be honest, because mm-hmm. he's not he's not big on kick returns that sort of stuff. Um, so and he's short kicking games okay. Um, I think it just makes sense that you'd have him at six, and then you just get a genuine fullback that's well, thing to do, you know, make make meters that would be helpful they like yeah. if, here's here's how you could improve Parramatta with two signings in my opinion mm-hmm. you get Payne Haas you ditch Dylan Brown and mm-hmm. you pick up Dane Laurie I was gonna say Dane Laurie <laughs> I was gonna say it that's how you it, do it yeah that would be great hey they would become very very threatening all of a sudden and then you can you've got the situation and you go, we can either play Laurie or Gutherson at six, the other one at fullback, but Laurie would be better at fullback than Gutherson. Yeah, yeah. I I, I actually thought Laurie might have ended up playing five eighth for the Panthers and it just didn't shake out for him. Um so yeah, he, he does have the ability to play five eighth, and I guess it is a it's a hedge, you know. Um yeah. if it doesn't work out as he him as the fullback and, and Gutherson you know, up in the line, then you can switch them back, you know. That's right. That would be pretty interesting. That that would probably be the best way to make that work, and I think that would make Parramatta scary, frightening in attack. Yeah, because at the like at you the got moment, Paul, Paul Owen Haas coming on both sides of the ruck in the middle. Fuck off! It'd be terrible. It's be <laughs> terrible. At, at right now, I, the Parramatta Eels pack doesn't worry me as a Panthers fan. And to be fair, no, no pack in, in the game does. No. You, you put Haas in that Parramatta team and there's something different all of a sudden. Yeah, absolutely. Immediately better. Yeah. Um, More worried about him. If you, if, you did, if you could do a straight swap, and I know you can't, but just the addition of Haas, subtraction of Brown, I'm way more worried about that Parramatta team then. Yeah. Yeah, that I think that would that would help them out a lot. Yeah. Uh, that, Can we get Payne Haas into a Panthers jersey? And just probably could, but the next ten years. <laughs> <laughs> would the the loss of Crichton cover the payment for Haas? I'm not sure it would. I don't think it would, no. You might have to ditch someone else. I think one of the problems the Panthers have is that they they lose players, but then the the contr- the contracts of the guys they've got under contract they they're just growing every year so yeah I think that's, that's the problem they've got I think what Penrith need to do I don't think they need to worry about paying half they need to find a hooker yeah yeah not that you know Kenny's doing a bad job but I think they just need someone with a bit more spark out of dummy half yeah one hundred percent that, oh, that would make a huge difference to him. I tell you what, I would love to get Ben Hunt for the rest of the year at Penrith. If they, if they got Ben Hunt for the rest of the year, and it would, we've talked about it, it'd be unfair, but that'd be it, I reckon. Oh, you'd right. That's it. It's over. Yeah. Uh, 
For me, the the perfect hooker for the Panthers when fully fit, unfortunately hasn't been the last few years because of injuries, would be Jaden Braley because defensively very strong but still has the playmaking that you need out of dummy half as well. He's yep. got a pretty handy short kicking game. Um, just a well-rounded sort of performer in the middle. It would just it suit their defensive style as well. He's very direct and, and very good at shutting down a player one on one, despite his size. Yeah, he'd he'd be good there. So you you basically get an upgraded Kenny, really. Yeah, because Sonny Luke hasn't panned out. No, no. Um, so I think that would work best. But poor old Jaden Braley, man, absolutely hammered with injuries and, and big ones. Yeah, like like. Not too long ago, all of them were pretty much career-threatening. Yeah. And it's, he's kind of lucky that just a few years down the track, he can come back from these ones. But oh, and they, I tell you what, an Achilles injury for a, somebody that does the work that a hooker does, all of that yeah. bending over and stuff, that's rough. Well, I mean, and Robbie Farah's last season and a half, his Achilles was starting to give him drama. He didn't yeah. have the actual injury there, but it was getting so sore and worn from all of the work because mm. he started getting – because when he started, he wasn't that good defensively. He was quite small mm. for a hooker. But he had to do a lot of work to, you know, bulk up his shoulders and his upper body strength so that he could at least stick to the tackles in the middle. Um but all of that work in the middle, plus all of the running that he would do from dummy half and having to slide into halfback every now and then because the Tigers' attack was, let's be honest, was, the, the cracks were being papered over by just Brooks and Benji being so damn good all the time. Mm. But, yeah, it would mean that every now and then Farrah would have to shift to halfback in order to give Benji a bit of space for Benji to do what he needed to do. And so he's doing a lot more running around the field than most hookers would have to do. And you could just see in those last two seasons there when he came back, as much as he was playing really good footy, there'd be times where he'd be hobbling by the end of the game because uh, the pain in his legs was just getting a bit much. And yeah. I think that last game he played against the Sharks, um, he had to get pain-killing injections in his in his legs in order to play. And he was a, like a last-minute call-up. Yeah. And he was barely getting around. His, his legs were doing, you know, giving so much grief, as was his back for the last few seasons as well. So, if Braley's struggling now and having got worse injuries than what Farah had, and Farah's were just through wear and tear, they didn't actually put him out. Yeah. It, it doesn't work well, especially now that the game is played so much more intensely in the middle where the hooker is, whereas when Farah was playing at his peak, it was wide of the ruck. Yeah, a little bit wider, yeah. So, he didn't have to do as much as what the current hookers have to do. Yeah, that's insane, man. That it's a shame for Braley because he is a bloody good player too. Oh, he's amazing. He's so good. And he's probably the best player so at Newcastle when he's full oh, fit. I, I certainly think he is. Yeah. Um, very underrated player. I mean, think about it. when the when the Sharks had to choose between him and his younger brother, they very reluctantly let Jaden go. Mm. And I believe the reason why they kept Blake on was just because he was younger. Like yeah, we're going to get a few more was. years out of him, so we may as well just hang on to this fella. They might have I, – I wonder if they maybe also looked at his uh, – like, I don't remember him having any real injury concerns back then, though. James, seems, oh, God, no. No, yeah, not at all. He only happened, got him at the Knights. Yeah, it seems to have happened at the Knights. But Blake's turned out to be a remarkably good attacking hooker, mm. much more than anyone thought he was going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's starting to get the defensive aspect built up. But mm-hmm. – uh, yeah, Jaden always looked pretty damn solid. There's no surprise that the he was here at the captaincy at the Knights there briefly while he was playing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he'd be him fully fit and in, and in form would be perfect for the Panthers. And that, he wouldn't cost you the bank either. No, I bet you could probably get him on a discount like from the Knights. But I, I mean, when you get him, you might not even get him next year at this point. Like for, with his injury yeah. rehab and stuff, he that's, might need another all. year out. Yeah. So yeah, it's, that's an interesting one. What else was there? There was another transfer one on here somewhere. I think I, was, I heard uh, Sean Johnson got extended for one more season this year at the uh, today for the Warriors. Yeah, uh, that was 
really good news because everything was pointing towards him not uh, going around next year. Man, didn't he prove us both wrong? We were yeah. like, oh, he's fucking done. <clears throat> he was, though. He was. It was over. And it just shows you, doesn't it? It shows you the impact a coach who knows what they're doing can have on a player. Yeah. And Webster's just straightened up the Warriors' outside runners. Straightened them up. And so he's just... Every time Sean Jensen gets the ball, he's got two blokes on his outside, both running a straight line. You can pick front one, back one. Doesn't matter. Mm. And he's got one either side every time. And it's just made... It's just... It's done wonders for him. And he's... Because he's got that. Defense is holding off. That's giving him room to move. It's just little fucking things. They're so simple, but it makes so much sense and it works so well for him. And that's... That's the beauty of getting a coach who understands his squad. He, um, I mean, it, the coach of the year is so over. It's just him. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. To, like, the turnaround in that team. And it's a – people probably don't realise what a big personnel turnover they've had too, but the fact that he's been able to do it with that big pers- personnel turnover is amazing in its own right. Absolutely. And to get Johnson back. And that's – even when Johnson was playing good footy, he'd have like a few back to back weeks where he just he was just cold. Yeah. And then some someone would just flick the switch and bam he's back on again. Mm. And he's barely had that this year. Yeah, it's been very consistent. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's been really um really impressive about the way he's been playing this year. Mm-hmm. So um and you know, one year, perfect deal. I think with Sean Johnson, the way he's playing at the moment he would happily keep signing one-year contract extensions for now until whenever he decides to retire. If it's going to keep seeing him playing good footy, mm. he's at that point now where if he doesn't get another contract, I've had a good run. But yeah, if I'm that, playing well enough and I get another year, fucking you, Brady. Yeah, and that a, a lot of that comes down to trust between both parties too. Oh, yeah. You know, and just being, being like in your situation and, and realising that, you know, he he loves playing at the club. He's now back at home. They're back in New Zealand. Um, he's playing good footy. He's feeling good physically. Just let's go one at a time then. And and that's a real good situation for a place to be in. Uh, Wayne Bennett used to just sign one-year deals with the Broncos. It was just year by year for a very long time. Yeah. Um, and I bet that was his most comfortable uh, contract situation that he ever had. Oh, bloody hell. That's the way to do it, though. You've got everyone constantly playing for a contract. Yeah, yeah. If everyone does their job, everyone keeps fucking getting contracts. It's, you know, it's all, it's right, a, it's all right way to be. It is, especially if, you, if you've if got a coach like that who's willing to back you to, to that extent. Mm-hmm. I'll keep giving you contracts, mate. You just keep playing good footy. Mm. You won't mind so much. But if you're sort of a more inconsistent player who might drop in and out of form, you go, mm, I'd kind of like you to sign me on a seven-year deal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you uh, reckon is the longest contract a club would give at the moment? Well, I'd say like three years seems to be like the as comfortable as the club would get with a player. I feel, yeah, when I hear somebody has signed a four-year deal, like I think Brooks signed a four-year deal, didn't he? Yeah. Um, that I when I when I hear four year deals, I'm like, wow, You're that's like, mm, are we sure? Yeah. The first I thing feel... I look up when they sign and say, "Oh, we're signing for four years." I, I look at their current age and I look at what age they'll be in the fourth year, and I go, "If they're 22, yep, no worries." Yeah. If they're 27, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot can happen between. Like you're going into your prime, but. Things can be very different between like twenty eight and thirty one. Oh yeah, it's it's a really interesting one. I'm just uh, tr- trying to think like who would be, what would be the longest deal you would give an NRL player right now, and who would it be? Oh, yeah, because he, it'd be easy to say I'll, I'll give a long deal to some you know, two-year rookie who's been playing good footy this year. Mm, mm. But I kind of want a little bit more 
like a few more seasons of really good form behind him to be confident of signing him long term. So I'm thinking someone who'd be like 24 years old and I'd sign give, him to a six year deal. Yeah, I, I would give. I'd so give Seth, Patrick Patrick Carrigan, I'd probably give him a five year deal. Y- oh yeah, that's a real good one. That's a really good one. Yeah, he'd be good for five years. He'd be he'd be good for five years. I I think the longest I would give it would be seven to Cleary. Takes him through to thirty two. Yeah. Um, I think he'll still be good thirty two. Absolutely. Um yeah. It'd be something like that. Yeah. Someone who you know is going to be more often than not, they're going to be on the field and playing a good quality football the whole time. And, and, and someone who's going to be responsible as well. Yeah, and and physically is in pretty good nick. Yeah. Can, can I tell you what, Carrigan is a really, really good one, hey? I mean, I, fuck, I, mean, I love the, the way he goes about his business, man. Yeah, same here. Super reliable. He's a real leader. He's a smart dude. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, I... I think I've said this before. He'd be my next Australian captain. Oh yeah, he's he's a genuine, like long term leader. No matter yeah. where, what role you put him in. Yeah. Man, that's yeah. a really good one. That's a real good one. I'm a Carrigan fan. <laughs> I'm I'm, not, I'm on the Paddy bus. <laughs> and then Luke, and then Luke Brooks four years, right? Like we're in oh, agreement on that. You yeah, give Luke yeah, Brooks four years. In. Lock that in. Yeah, yeah. Every time. Every time. Uh, Shoes, I mean, what about Schuster? Five years? Um, six? Yeah, look, I think he'd be really good. Probably on a six-year deal. I think um, I think London scholars would love having him around. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Would, would you take? Okay, okay. Here's the deal. All right, here's one. Three years of Schuster, or one year of Brody Croft. I'll take Croft. I will take Croft every time as well. It'll be cheaper, and I've only got to deal with it for a year. Three years of Schuster, two years of Croft. Croft. I would take Croft as well. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be cheaper and still less years. <laughs> oh, that's so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, Manly. See, well, this is what happens when somebody uh, buried that North Sydney jersey. Yeah, well, you did say that. Yeah, under their new stand. It's just all going downhill. Isn't it amazing how Manly had somehow, against all odds with Seabold there, given how Seabold's last coaching tenure went, mm-hmm. they looked like they turned things around under him and they were going in the right direction. Mm. And then he spent all of this year building a squad for next year that is utter fucking garbage. <sighs> and I every got... signing, he makes it worse. What gets me is because they're a privately owned club, and we talked about that it, things were getting weird with that side of it last year, at the end of last year. Like whatever happened with them turning on Des Hasler was strange. Um, yeah. But you would think that if you owned a rugby league club, you'd you've got to be a hardcore rugby league person. Like you, you know, it's not somebody that's completely clueless about the game. If you've decided to invest that much money into it. So when you cluelessly buy this fucking guy who took the Broncos to being one of the worst teams ever, and then he starts signing these fucked players. Well, even actually, before that, the assistant that they signed for him is Flanagan. Yeah, and, and who <laughs> who was like, I'll be there until I might not be there because I might have to coach some rugby union shit during the NRL season, but I'll be there for a while. And they're like, um, yeah, that sounds like a good deal. And then while I'm still there, I'm going to be building the roster for another team. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking manly. The fuck? That's so crazy. You got some bloke who was broken and, and sucking and crying and had to leave because he had a turn. And some bloke who was cheating and overrated as fuck as a coach. Mm-hmm. And cheating. You know, cheating why would you sign possible? those two? I don't know. I like don't that, know. That's a dumber decision than signing Tim Sheens. Yes. Yeah, it definitely is. I just don't know how you look at Seabold's record, right? And you look at it and you say, yeah, this guy, no, this is the guy. 
I just have some, I just got a feeling about this guy that took the Broncos to being one of the worst five teams defensively of all time. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take one of the most successful teams ever and make them shit in a year. Yeah, he t- he took the he took the team that people were saying there's this young team is the best team going forward and then the Panthers after them. He took that team and made them people were comparing them to the fucking magpies in the late nineties. Yeah. And they were doing everything to be comparable with them. He had their players crying on the field. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Let's see. And they him. said he must he, maybe he's one of those dudes. Maybe he's got the uh, Moses and Bai thing where you meet him and you're just like, this, this guy's fucking amazing. I, I don't know, man. I don't know. You'd think that there are certain things that you could do as a coach mm-hmm. that would just absolutely blacklist you from being an NRL coach again. Yeah. And coaching your team to being the absolute worst you could ever possibly imagine in the modern game. Yeah. Is high on the list. Being a repeat cheat would be high on that fucking list, if not the top of the list. Yeah. Gone, nah, let's take them both. <laughs> let's have them both. <laughs> Sounds like a fucking dream team to me. <laughs> this shit's got to work. You watch. The two <laughs> wrongs, two wrongs, they make a right. <laughs> it's so weird. We, we need someone to buy Manly, hey? <laughs> If you if you had enough money to buy the Manly Seagulls, would you move them? I'd move them to Campbelltown. Oh, would you? Yep. I tell you what, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a silly idea at all. What would happen to the West Tigers though if you did that? Let me put it this way: Where in the world could you move the West Tigers to to make them more successful than they currently are? Campbelltown, but it'd have to, you'd have to just take them to Campbelltown <laughs> because they've been these travelling fucking Dixies for all this fucking time and done yeah. nothing. Yeah, and you... <laughs> I, I, was, I was doing some stats the other day. Some yeah. people would have seen on Twitter where I was looking at what I called um, dinner shitties. So instead of dynasties, <laughs> dinner shitties. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the okay. longest so these were teams that had the longest streaks of being of finishing the season in the bottom half of the ladder. Okay. Right? This is consecutive seasons. Okay. Um because the this current West Tigers team, they're on that list. Really? Still already? Yeah, they're on there. So as we know, we've got the Panthers on there. Yep. Nineteen sixty seven to nineteen eighty three. Yep. That's the longest run. Horrifying. Right. Um, South, 1990 to 2006 is the next longest. Yeah. Um, theirs also was the worst defensively. So they had the worst points difference out of all of them. So, for example, oh. the Panthers team that went 67 to 83, their points difference was sitting around uh, minus 2,200. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Yeah. But South, who played probably 40 games less, yeah. their points difference was around about 4, 000, minus 4,100. Jesus Christ. Almost double. God. In, le- in less games. Yeah, that's crazy. Theirs was atrocious. The Tigers, are, as far as number of games goes, theirs, theirs is currently the third longest. Wow. But seasons-wise, it's equal with um, a few, I think North Sydney. We went 1908 to 1920. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, those seasons were so short it didn't really matter. Mm-hmm. But the Tigers, um, their line started out being pretty aggressively bad. It sort of followed that, that bad south line a little bit through to about game 100. Mm-hmm. Then it started to stabilise and it... it got up to where the Panthers line was, and it's followed the Panthers line pretty closely since about game 220. They're currently around about game 275 or so into this run, and they're still very close as far as um, the cumulative points difference. 
Yeah, that's but, that's rough because that Panthers that we've talked about it. They were horrifyingly bad when they come into yes. the comp. But the Panthers they kept sort of stabilizing a little bit as they kept going down, but the it started to plateau a little bit after the game three hundred. Because they okay. that's when they started getting the the early eighties. Yeah. They're getting this young talent sent in the company. Started they're starting to move up the ladder. Yeah. The Tigers though, just in the last few games. They've gone from being almost equal with the Panthers, and they have taken a massive fucking nosedive towards the South Line. Yeah. So this, they're in this area between the two where they they don't know whether they're going for the longevity of the Panthers record <laughs> or the shit defensiveness of the South record, and they figured, why not have both? <laughs> Let's go for both of them. So, so the the lo- what is the longest by seasons? Uh, the Panthers, 67 to 83. So that was uh, 16. What, 16 seasons. Okay. And, the, and then South was 1990 to 2006, but they had two seasons where they were um, out. Yeah, so that's kind of messed mess with that a little bit. Yep. Um, yeah, North Sydney, 1909 to 1920. So that was 12 seasons. The Tigers are 12 seasons. Um, Parramatta went 1950 to 61 or 62. Mm-hmm. Annandale, 1910 to 1920, so that was 11 seasons. And Uni, 1927 to 37, was 11 seasons. <laughs> they're, they're worse than Uni. <laughs> so it's worth noting that Annandale and University, both their runs ended because they got axed. <laughs> Penrith got axed partway through theirs. Oh, sorry, not Penrith. The South got axed partway through theirs. Yep, yep. Um, North Sydney were the only ones who ended their drought by winning a premiership. Oh wow, that's that's cool. That's and really they cool. went they went from ending their drought in 1920 to winning. Um, yeah, <laughs> they ended their drought in 1920 because the very next year they were undefeated and won the premiership, and then they backed up by winning back to back titles in 2022. That's very cool. Um, I say big yeah. things for that North team. Oh yeah, up and up for them. <laughs> but yeah, it's it an interesting, interesting look at stats there. Um, yeah. But the Tigers one looks like to be the one that's it's at a situation now where a lot of these lines were steadying on their downward run, and the Tigers ones is, is accelerating. Well, okay, so like next year, unless something dramatic happens, they're not making the finals, right? No. So that, that'll that be 13 years for them. That's right, yeah. And th- then they're only three years away from s- that 16 record. And I tell yeah, you, I tell- I'd, I'd imagine that by the time they get to, if they miss the next season and a half, yeah. so I reckon midway through 1925, they might be in a situation where they'll have been out of the finals for more games than any other team ever has consecutive. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Just because um, the seasons are longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, man, that's that's rough. That's really rough. It should be impossible in the salary cap era. Yeah, it should be. A- and they've got that giant junior base. Is they just? It should be like when Penrith were, have been at their worst in the last twenty years, where they. Even when they're not, even when they're not fucking using their juniors properly, they still find a Michael Jennings, you know. Yeah. Yes, I found also that um, since 1908, there's been 13 occasions where a team has gone for at least nine consecutive seasons, finishing in the bottom half of the ladder. Mm-hmm. On three of those occasions, that streak ended when the team was folded, mm-hmm. and one other was. Um, the South one where they were they actually were folded for two seasons before they came back. So that means that there was a thirty percent chance of being folded if you went nine or more seasons finishing the bottom half of the ladder. The Tigers are currently at twelve seasons. Man, uh that's that's really rough. Um I the the thing that gets me is we could really use an expansion club in the MacArthur region. It'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've seen Panthers fans talking about um, when they'll have to not be at the stadium because it's getting rebuilt at Penrith Footy Stadium, saying that they should go to Campbelltown to try and 
sort of muscle in on that territory a bit and get some people from there to become Panthers fans. And I don't think that's too bad of an idea. It's probably not, but um, the the ground... I, I, a being worked on Panthers Stadium, as it currently is, is an upgrade on the way Campbelltown is at the moment. Yeah, that's the thing. And it's, I mean, it's... It's a much easier sell to say to your corporate partners and everything, look, we won't be at Penrith, but we'll be at, at Parramatta Stadium and you'll have all these nice facilities and stuff and, you know. Yeah. So. so I don't or, think, no, I or mean, we can go to Campbelltown. Have you got some banners we can put on the fence? Yeah. <laughs> How much does Campbelltown hold? It wouldn't be very many these days. Uh, that's a good question. I would say fifteen, maybe at most. Oh no, I think it. I think it is slightly higher than that. Okay. Because um, I think the highest attendance they've had was twenty k. But was that under the current configuration? No. So it says here the capacity is currently seventeen and a half. Oh wow. Okay. But. Um. Yeah, I'm sure the ground record, though, was higher than that. Yeah. A recorded highest crowd figure of 20,527 for a game between the Tigers and the Cowboys in 2005. 2005. When was it re, redone? Um, it's got it, a... I think it was redone before then. I think all that's happened since then is they've like done mild upgrades and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it... I know we've said it before, but I'm pretty certain that it was either the local council or the state government or maybe a combination of the two have said mm. that they would be happy to dump lots more money into Campbelltown if they mm. could get a guarantee that there'd be more games played there by the West Tigers every year. Yeah, and the Tigers just won't. Yeah, I mean, if the Tigers were smart, they'd say, you know what, in order just to get this upgrade to make it worthwhile, just say, you know what, fine, you know what, for two seasons... We'll play all our home games there. But you don't tell them that. You say, you know what, we're going to move out to Campbelltown permanently. We're going to play every home game out there every year. Just to make the government go, you beauty, that's perfect. Green tick for you. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, they've got a massive fucking stadium out there. The thing's upgraded to the hills. And you go, okay, who wants to go to Leichhardt now? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. I I don't know why. And and you go, right, now that we're committed out here, Fuck Concord off as well. Yeah. Set up our base out here. Bam, now they, you're I, done. I wonder what they could do with that Concord facility. Like, it, like, would it be the sort of facility that you could sell? Like, I don't know who, I don't know if it's an asset that's a state asset or if it's a West Tigers asset or what. I, I don't think it's West Tigers asset. I'm pretty yeah. sure it's, it's a shared venue, so it would be... Like local council owned, I'd imagine. Yeah. Um, given the state of the elite training facility that was that used to be around there, you could probably put shipping containers around it. <laughs> it's a storage place. <laughs> That'd work. Be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it, it'd look like the front row in a rugby union game. Yeah. Because yeah, it'd be just as exciting too as rugby union game watching that. Yeah. And the. Uh, the shipping container just sitting there would be kind of like the West Tigers attack. <laughs> doesn't move anywhere. Doesn't offer anything. Just sits talk, there. Talk as much as Luke Brooks, it would. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, you just got to make sure the doors are locked shut. You don't want them to accidentally swing open and a noise comes out of the hinges. <laughs> <laughs> okay. People would be sitting there going, was that a, was that a direction? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't know what was going on there. Um, yeah, if that's what it took to get the ground upgraded, that's a no-brainer for me. I'd, be, I'd just say, you know what, say, say to everyone on the board, we need to do this for a few years just to get games played here, and then, you know, even if we scale it back, once the upgrade's done, they're not going to come down and pull fucking stands down because we start taking games away from here. True, true. So we play here for two, three seasons if we have to, like 10 games every year, right? Now, other two or three games, take one to Homebush, one to Parramatta, one to Leichhardt, boom. 
everything else play out at Campbelltown. If that's what it takes to get this thing upgraded massively to where it should be, to get us set up with a base out here, then that's what we've got to do. Like, that's step one, and that's a massive fucking step. And then after that, move the base out there, and then boom, we're now based in the MacArthur region. Imagine if it was that easy, and you're going to get your ground upgraded massively at no cost to the club in the in the uh, process of getting that to happen. That's a fucking no-brainer. Why would you say no to that? I, d- I don't know. I... Oh, we just want to play three games there. <laughs> you fucking idiots. It's Both insane. And look, it's one of the few grounds, too, that, that's around Sydney. Mm-hmm. It's got a train station right outside it. Mm, yeah. And a leagues club. The car park's next to the freaking football ground. Yeah. Well, the, the, park a of it. the parking's a bit dodge. Well, you don't park out there, man. That's why the train's there. Uh, well, I don't take that. I don't take trains. Train. I'm not some povo. <laughs> Fucking trains. <laughs> you will be if you park your car out there and you come back three hours later and the fucking wheels have been stripped off the thing. I was so glad when my car was still there. <laughs> let me tell you. I was walking. I, I had to park my car around the back. There was like a back of a pub that was near there. And I had to walk past some shops and I walked around that corner. And I was like, please be there. Please be there. And it was. It was. So. Was there a brick through the windscreen? No. He's gone again. I'm here. I can hear. All right. I thought you were just gone. You just went quiet. Uh, I think my internet's stuffing up. Maybe we should wrap it up, eh? We'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Well, I mean, on that on that cheery note about Campbelltown, um, if you're from Campbelltown, we don't apologise. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fucking shithole, that's all. It's just Tamworth in Sydney. <laughs> oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thanks for tuning in. Make sure you check us out on all the socials. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. Follow us all on there. That'd be great. And uh, we'll catch us all next time.